How's everybody doing? <laughs> Exam's coming up, right? Hooray. So a couple pieces of news relevant to that. A lot of people ask me questions about where does the material stop and end, or stop for the exam and all that sort of stuff. So I've decided to make the material for the exam end with the end of the material on enzymes. This, that is, the material that you see on the screen. Okay? Um, I will probably get a little bit ahead uh, today and start talking about enzyme mechanisms, uh, which will uh, be on the next exam. So um, the material for this exam stops with the enzymes, that is the stuff that's on the screen right here. Okay? Um, I've also been asked about review sessions, and I haven't yet scheduled a review session, but I'm tentatively planning it for Friday night. Oh. There's no time I can say where somebody doesn't go, oh. All right. I apologize. I do videotape them, and you know I will post them and like I post the lectures and so forth, but um, I can't find a perfect time for a class of 400. So, uh, but that's my plan. I will announce that once I get the room and so forth reserved. Okay? The tentative plan is Friday evening. It ruins my Friday evening too. So, I'm an old married dude. Yeah. Well, I just sit around and work crossword puzzles or something, right? I do that a lot. I like crossword puzzles. Okay. So. Uh, last time I got started talking about inhibition, and I was a little bit rushed with that, so I want to go back through that uh, a little bit more carefully and tell you more about enzyme inhibition, because I think enzyme inhibition is very important uh, for uh, people working in the biological sciences to understand, and particularly people who want to uh, have some sort of career in, in um, healthcare. So um, I'm going to start back here with the um, um, competitive inhibition. So competitive inhibition, I will remind you, um, occurs when one treats an enzyme with a substrate that resembles the normal substrate, but the enzyme can't act on it. So we think of this as a drug. Okay? So I gave, I gave an example last time of the drug methotrexate, which looks very much like the natural substrate for an enzyme, and the natural substrate is called dihydrofolate. You don't need to know that necessarily, but um, should, you should know what methotrexate is. Um, and they resemble each other physically, chemically. They're very similar to each other. But the enzyme that acts on, meth on, on uh, um, uh, uh, dihydrofolate cannot act on methotrexate. Okay? So it just sits there and does nothing. All right. So as I said, this is used sometimes in chemotherapy because it allows you to uh, stop the cell from making nucleotides. This, cell is this, this enzyme is necessary for making nucleotides. And as a consequence, uh, the cell runs out of nucleotides. If it's a cancer cell that needs them very quickly, it tends to die more quickly than does a non-cancer cell that doesn't, need those that, 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 that doesn't need them quite as fast. OK. So competitive inhibition will always occur with a substrate that looks uh, with an inhibitor that always looks like the natural substrate. Okay? It will always be that. Now, I showed this graph, and I said, well, we can just ignore these bottom two lines. All right? And we're really interested in this green line at the top, and we're interested in this green uh, and the black line at the very top. When we talk about inhibition, we have to compare it to something. We can't say something is inhibited by looking at one curve or one line because we have no comparison. So what did I do in making this? Well, I took those 20 tubes and I put varying amounts of enzyme, varying amounts of substrate, same amount of enzyme, same buffer, let them all react for the same period of time, and saw that that generated a V versus S plot, that is velocity relative rate here versus substrate concentration that looked like this. Okay, I emphasize that was done with no inhibitor, zero inhibition. All right, so there's my comparator. Now I've got this compound that is an inhibitor, at least I think it's an inhibitor, and I want to see, is it an inhibitor, and how, what does it look like when I use, do this reaction? Well, as I said last time, one of the things that we have to think about in doing any experiment is we only want to have one variable. If we have two variables, we can't compare. So the variable that we have is substrate concentration. So in the second set of experiments, I added an inhibitor, but I add the same amount of inhibitor to every tube. 
the same amount of inhibitor to every tube. That's critical. Now, what these different lines on here show are varying amounts of inhibitor, which really, for our purposes, don't really matter. Okay? I add the same amount of inhibitor for every tube here that's this, this green line. Every single one has the same amount of inhibitor. Well, we see the velocity go up, and of course it makes sense that the velocity goes up because as we increase the concentration of substrate, it becomes increasingly more likely that the substrate is going to be with the enzyme binds instead of the inhibitor. It's just a numbers game. Down here, very low concentrations of, um, of substrate, I might have more inhibitor than I have substrate. There, it's going to be more likely that the enzyme is going to bind the inhibitor than it's going to bind the substrate. And please turn that damn thing off. OK? All right, so if we uh, increase the substrate, which is what we're doing in each successive tube, it becomes more and more likely that the substrate is going to beat the race to the enzyme. It's going to win. All right. Well, we see that this goes up, it goes up, it goes up, and finally we get up here to very, very high substrate concentrations, and what we discover is that those tubes behave as if there's no inhibitor there at all. Well, that makes sense because, as I said last time, if I had a million times more substrate than I had inhibitor, it's going to be a million times more likely that the substrate is going to win the race to the enzyme than it is that the inhibitor is going to win the race to the enzyme. So I can't tell a difference of one part in one million for velocity so that the two Vmaxes essentially are the same. The enzyme is saturated with substrate, just like it was when I had no inhibitor. So because of that, it means that when I do the kinetic analysis for competitive inhibition, Vmax remains the same. Vmax does not change. Okay, yes? Is there anything that you can add that would make Vmax be reached with a smaller amount of substrate? That would be a pretty, pretty cool drug, right? So uh, the answer is not really, okay? Not really, okay. Now, there are some tricks you can do with enzymes that make things look like you've changed uh, Vmax and so forth, but basically the answer is not really, okay? All right, so um, here is what our um, uh, plot would look like. Now, I noted also that we have two parameters to consider. We have Vmax is one. We also have uh, Km, right? So what happens to the Km? Well, Km was the substrate concentration that gave Vmax over 2. Where's Vmax over 2? It's right there. If I look at it for the normal, I go down. It's something right here. If I look at it for the inhibited, I see that it's going to be further to the right meaning that it's going to take more substrate more substrate to get to the same Vmax over 2, meaning more substrate translates to a higher Km. What's happened is I have changed the enzymes. It's actually its apparent affinity, but it's, a, it's affinity for its substrate. Okay. So that's what competitive inhibition does. It doesn't affect Vmax but it increases Km. Okay, now, that's an important concept. I showed you what that meant if we looked at it in a lineweaver burke plot. Okay, on a lineweaver burke plot, this is what it would, would it resemble. Here is the black line showing us what we had before, where we had no inhibition, gave us the nice straight line with a crossing at 1 over Vmax and minus 1 over Km on the x-axis. Since I know, for example, that um, competitive inhibition has uh, the same Vmax. It's not surprising that the two lines will cross at the same point because one of our Vmax is going to be the same for the two of them since the Vmax is the same for the two of them. Km, however, increases, meaning that one over Km, or minus one over Km, is going to get closer to zero. So that's why this line is over here. It's closer to zero than that one is. All right? So this is very characteristic for what we would see for competitive inhibition. Yes, Kimberly. Confused by the term apparent change in KM. Okay. Well, I shouldn't have thrown that term out, uh, but, I, but, I'll, but I'll answer your question or your concern. Okay. 
So we don't really change the enzyme. Okay? We don't really change the enzyme. We only affect the enzyme when the substrate, when the, when the inhibitor is bound to it. And when it's, the inhibitor is bound to it, we can't measure anything. All right? So what it looks like we're doing is we're knocking out a certain percentage of the enzyme at that concentration. We can only measure active en we can only measure the amount of enzyme that's actually active. So at let's say 50 or where we've we've changed let's say 50% of the enzyme, we only have 50% of the enzyme there, which is why it gives an apparent change in velocity at that at that point, okay? So, uh, don't worry too much about the word apparent. Okay. If we think about what's happening with these enzymes, actually, I'll this gives me a good lead-in for the non-competitive inhibition. If we think about what's happening with these enzymes, we can imagine, let's say we start out with a um, uh, uh, thousand molecules of inhibitor and a thousand molecules of substrate, right? What's the likelihood? So how much enzyme is going to be active if they, they can bind as much enzyme as they want? Well, we would say the likelihood is that 50% of the enzyme is going to be knocked out. I have one enzyme molecule in there, right? 50% or two enzyme molecules in there. 50% of the time it's going to be knocked out because it's going to be half the time it's going to be an inhibitor, half the time it's going to be a substrate, right? When I increase that concentration of substrate, now I've got a different percentage of enzyme that's going to be active. Let's say I've got 10 times as much substrate as I do enzyme, as I do inhibitor. Then one-tenth of the time I'm going to have inhibitor, 90% of the time I'm going to have the enzyme there, right? That's why that line, when I go looking, let me just show you on the curve, when I go looking up that line, right, the further I get up this line, the greater and greater percentages of the enzyme are active at any given time. Because it's much more likely that the enzymes are binding to the, the substrate instead of the inhibitor. Remember that the inhibitor is not binding irreversibly. It's binding and it's coming off. It's binding and it's coming off. Yes? Well, that's just the way it's drawn. But in fact, they will actually, they will actually go to the same place. Yeah, they will. OK. So that's competitive inhibition. Non-competitive inhibition is always a little bit harder conceptually for students to understand. So I try to take some simplifying things with that. OK? Non-competitive inhibition is fundamentally different from competitive inhibition. Its name suggests that, for one. And in reality, it is very different because we don't have competition going on. We don't have competition going on. When I have that varying amount of substrate between the different tubes that I have, the more substrate I have, the greater the percentage of enzymes that I have that will be active because it's more likely that it's going to bind to substrate. That's not the case in non-competitive inhibition. Let's imagine I have 1,000 enzyme molecules and I have 100 inhibitors. And um, if I said to you, what percentage of the enzyme is going to be active under those circumstances, you would say, well, 10% will be inactive because 10%, 100 divided by 1,000, will have bound to the enzyme. That's going to leave 900 enzymes active. 90% of the enzyme is going to be active, right? Let's say I add some substrate to that. Am I going to change the percentage of enzyme that's active? I won't, because there's not competition. It doesn't matter how much substrate I add, I'm always going to have, in that case, 90% of the enzyme active. Because the substrate can't compete away the inhibitor. In the competitive inhibition, I could compete it away. I could make it so that the... Um, uh, inhibitor was essentially invisible to the enzyme. But since they're not trying to get to the same site, the inhibitor is always going to get to the site 10% of the enzymes. 10% of the enzymes are always going to be bound with inhibitor. You say, well, it comes off. I say, okay, it comes off. It goes to another enzyme. It comes off. It doesn't stay on there permanently. But in essence, 10% of the time, the enzymes, or 10% of the enzymes are going to be inhibited. Doesn't matter how much substrate I add. Well, what have I just done? What have I just done? I've changed from having 100% <clears throat> of my enzyme active to having 90% of my enzyme active, right? Everybody with me? Doesn't matter how much substrate I add, I've always got 90% of my enzyme active, right? 
What happens to Vmax and we change the amount of enzyme? It changes. Vmax is dependent upon the amount of enzyme, which means it's dependent upon the amount of active enzyme that we have. So even though we've got 1,000 enzyme molecules there, only 900 of them are active, right? Let's imagine we did V versus S for 1,000 enzymes, and we did V versus S for 900 enzymes. Would they have the same Vmax? They would not. The 900 would have a lower Vmax. It would have a 90% value of the Vmax. Okay? When we do non-competitive inhibition, Vmax changes. When we do non-competitive inhibition, Vmax changes. Specifically, it decreases. Now, here's something that's going to, it throws everybody every time. And I'm just going to tell it to you. You won't like this. All right? KM doesn't change. Now, how in the heck can the KM not change? Well, I'll tell you. Okay, yeah. Well, let's think about what KM was. KM is a, just a second. So, KM is a constant parameter of an enzyme. It's not dependent on how much enzyme that we add, right? So I would expect that if I did a reaction where I didn't have any inhibitor, but I used 90% of the enzyme instead of 100% of the enzyme, that in both cases, I would get the same KM value. Right? That's what I'm doing here. And you say, well, why did it change in the first case? That's why I use the word apparent. We don't change the KM in the first case, but because we're changing in each tube a different amount of enzyme, it looks like we're changing the KM. It's the apparent KM that's changing. David? Exactly. So the affinity of the uninhibited enzymes is completely the same as it was before. Okay? Does that make sense? Other questions about that? All right. KM does not change. You say, that's why I said the apparent KM changes in the competitive inhibition. All right? And it's apparent because the amount of enzyme is varying, the amount of active enzyme is varying in each tube. Okay? So we've sort of confused the picture in the case of the competitive. All right. Very good. If we were to examine the plots for uh, Lineweaver-Burke for uh, the non-competitive, we would see something that looks like this. The black line indicates the um, kinetics when there's no inhibitor present. And the red line indicates the kinetics when the inhibitor is present. We see that they cross at the x-axis, which is minus 1 over Km. Since they have the same Km values, they should cross at the same minus 1 over Km value. And the question students invariably ask is, well, why is this line higher? So I'll ask you. Instead of asking you on an exam, I'll ask you here. Why is this line higher? You may ask you on an exam? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not asking you on an exam. I'm asking you here. Okay. What, what, you had a hand up? Vmax is smaller. So 1 over Vmax is larger. Right? That's why. Because Vmax is smaller, 1 over Vmax will be larger. Right? That's the nature of what a reciprocal is. So that's what it looks like for a non-competitive inhibition that's occurring. OK? Make sense? Well, I've got here, and I'm still thinking about it. Let's go back, and I didn't point out on the V versus S. Oops, sorry, wrong thing. On the V versus S, uh, what this looked like. Here's the uninhibited, and look at the inhibited. Doink. It's flattening out way below the Vmax of this guy up here. 
In this case, it looks like, oh, they probably had about 50% of the enzyme inhibited. That's probably about what they had. Because Vmax is 50% of the value that it was in the uninhibited. Okay? Again, the varying concentrations of inhibitor, we don't need to worry about those. But that's what this looks like. Make sense? No questions? Yes? I have a quick question. Um, would you say KM is when half of the en enzymes are binding to substrate? Would I say KM is when half the enzymes are binding to substrate? I would say no. I would say uh, KM is the uh, co substrate concentration that gives Vmax over 2. That doesn't necessarily mean half the enzymes are bound by substrate. Okay. Okay. So that's um, a quick and dirty uh, description of. And by the way, what I've been telling you all, I said all these things so far have to do with reversible inhibition. And I talked about why reversible inhibition was important, because if we're treating with a drug and it's fatal to, to certain types of cells, we want to make sure we can get it off and we don't harm our, our normal cells. All right. So reversible inhibitions are really desirable for many types of drug interactions because, again, we don't, if we do something that's going to kill cells, we have to be careful we're not killing our normal cells. Some types of inhibition, however, are irreversible. Irreversible. When I talk about an irreversible inhibition, I, we're, we're, we're talking about covalent, bind, covalent binding. Specifically, irreversible inhibition occurs in, so with something called suicide inhibition. Suicide inhibition. All right. Now, suicide inhibition occurs, and I, 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 when uh, one of the, the best examples we have of suicide inhibition is the way that penicillin works. Okay. Penicillin binds to an enzyme. It's known as DD transpeptidase, but you don't need to know that. Okay. That binds to an enzyme that bacteria use to make odd peptides. Odd peptides. Okay? So enzymes have in their cell wall, they have an odd peptide that we don't see hardly anywhere else in nature. And this peptide that's there is made up of D amino acids. We talked about that in the very first lecture. D amino acids. Almost all, the almost all of the amino acids we see in biological systems are in the L configuration. But bacteria you make this odd peptide that have D amino acids. There's D alanine. Okay? The reason that they, they make this peptide is they make, it, uh, they make it so that it is not cut by proteases. Proteases, which are designed to work on peptides that have L amino acids, can't cut this guy. All right? So that's why this is important. Now, I need to tell you what the suicide inhibitor does. The suicide inhibitor looks to the enzyme very much like the normal substrate. That is, penicillin looks very much like the normal substrate. But the difference is that when penicillin binds to the enzyme, it covalently binds to the active site. The enzyme can't get rid of it. The enzyme is completely killed. Well, you might say, well, but you said, you said reversible inhibition is important if we're killing cells. Remember, these are bacterial cells. We don't want it to come off. These are not human cells. We're treating a cancer. We're killing bacterial cells. Okay? So suicide inhibitors, in this case, work really well. Penicillin works really well because it stops the enzyme in its tracks, and it doesn't come off. Okay? That's a pretty cool thing to have. All right. So suicide inhibition will almost always occur with something that looks like a competitive inhibitor. That is, it'll resemble the normal substrate. All right? We don't call it a competitive inhibitor, although you might even see some books do that. We don't call it a competitive inhibitor because competitive inhibition means reversible. So it resembles a competitive inhibitor, but it's not a competitive inhibitor. Yes? Where does an allergic reaction come in? Okay. Where does an allergic reaction come in? So any allergic reaction comes in through activation of the immune system, which has nothing to do with, with the, the reactions here. So um, 
The immune system recognizes something as foreign and attacks it. That's true for any drug. Um, so that can, or any substance. So that's that's potentially what's happening with that. Yes. How is penicillin losing its effectiveness on bacteria? How is penicillin losing its effectiveness on bacteria? We hear about all these drug-resistant bacteria. Okay. There's a variety of ways in which bacteria can become resistant to um, drugs. In the case of penicillin, one of the most common things is that they have um, evolved the ability to make an enzyme called penicillinase, which basically binds to penicillin and degrades it before penicillin gets the chance to degrade the other enzyme. It's a race. And when you it's really interesting when you look at biology and you look at evolution of proteins and evolution of enzymes and so forth, that there is a warfare that literally goes on between the, uh, the, the systems that you know, get an advantage because they, they can make this or not make this or respond to this or not respond to this. And it's a very, very active um, area that happens biologically. There's many other schemes that they use. So, for example, we'll talk next term, just a second, we'll talk next term about other strategies that cells use, including cancer cells, where they will recognize a substance as foreign and then just kick it back out of the cell. So, therefore, if it, it needs to work inside the cell to do its thing, it has no effectiveness because it's kicked back out. Yeah, question over here? Oh, that's a good question. Are there any enzymes that, buy, that, that, can, uh, that are suicide inhibitors that don't bond covalently but might cause the enzyme to unfold in some way irreversibly? I don't know of any, and I think that would be unusual uh, to have happen. Now, that, that, that's at one level. At another level, detergents are suicide inhibitors because they do that. But, of course, they kill anything that, that they're going to buy. They're going to knock any, any protein that they get. So I guess... Uh, that's the one example I can think of, but no, no, nothing I can think of is designed specifically as drugs. It would be hard to do that because when you're thinking about folding, folding, of course, is a very complicated phenomenon for a lot of proteins. And I don't think you'd probably want to mess with that. But I won't say there aren't any, but I don't know of any. Suicide inhibitors are not common. Okay? They're not common. Okay. Um, let's see, I've got two other things to talk about here. One was, um, I will talk very briefly about um, DIPF. So DIPF seems a little bit like a suicide inhibitor, but it's really not, okay? It's not really a suicide inhibitor, okay? DIPF is a chemical substance. We'll talk about it uh, in the next lecture, actually. DIPF is a substance that will bind to the hydroxyl groups of serine. All right? That's what it does. It binds to the hydroxyl groups of serine, and when it does so, it doesn't come off. It's making a covalent bond. All right? Well, it's a fairly small molecule, and it can bind to essentially any serine on an enzyme. So it's not specific for the active site, for example. And it's small enough, it gets into the active sites of many enzymes very readily, without looking like the substrate. So it, it can, if an enzyme has a serine in its active site, inhibit that enzyme. So it's suicidal, but it doesn't resemble the substrate. Okay? So we don't really classify it as a suicide inhibitor. So it's just a chemical modifier that can inhibit enzymes by binding them covalently. Okay? Now, what we use this reagent for is to tell us at a very simple level, does this enzyme have a serine in its active site? Because if it has a serine in its active site, what happens is we see exactly what we see here. The serine gets gobbled up with this guy and we see the enzyme is no longer active because this hydroxyl of the serine was necessary for the enzyme to work and it doesn't work anymore. So it's a non-specific way of knocking out enzymes, and it does it by binding to serines. Will it knock out all enzymes? No, it won't. It will primarily knock out those enzymes that have serine in the active site. Yes? Is what? Is it another drug? Actually, this is not something you'd want to use as a drug because it'll react with any and every serine and every protein that you've got. 
So it would have some drastic side effects. So it's used as a, as a chemical uh, analysis agent in a biochem lab, for example. Yes, back there. Is the side product of this reaction HF? Uh, I guess it is. That's really nasty stuff too. Yeah. It gets you a couple ways. Yeah. But again, we're not using this as a drug. We're using this um, in, in, a, in a biochemistry laboratory to study an enzyme. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so if DIPF binds to serine at something other than the active site, will it change the enzyme? It might, it might not. Okay, so anything that we do to alter the enzyme can have an effect on the enzyme. It may also have no effect. But we know if it binds at the active site, it's going to knock out the, it's going to knock that, that enzyme. Okay, good questions. All right, and the last thing I'll just show you, I won't even hold you responsible for, so you can forget about this. Um, is the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase. The reason I mention this enzyme is we'll talk about this enzyme later in glycolysis, and it's a very important enzyme in glycolysis. You can see if we add this compound to it, that it binds to it and inactivates it, okay? So this is another inhibitor. Again, it's not a specific suicide inhibitor. It's binding uh, to a, a specific structure inside of this enzyme, but it's not being recognized like it's a substrate. So it's not really, again, what we would call a suicide inhibitor. The reason I mention this enzyme is because this enzyme is one of the examples of perfect enzymes that I talked about last time. This enzyme has a very, very high KCAT divided by KM. It's the only enzyme in glycolysis, that is the breakdown of sugar, that um, is perfect. We'll see it's right square, in the, excuse me, right square in the middle of glycolysis. And there's a very good reason why. I won't tell you why here what it is, but there's a very good reason why this enzyme is perfect. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Kimberly. When we talk about ribozymes as catalysts, we'll briefly mention ribozymes later when I talk about RNA. Uh, ribozymes are other catalytic uh, molecules, uh, and ribozymes are what we call catalytic RNAs. So proteins aren't the only things that catalyze reactions. RNAs can catalyze reactions, and ribozymes are what they're called. But I won't talk about them here. So, yeah. Okay. Well, how about a song? I think something to mix it up a little bit. Um, this is a song. It's about enzymes. Uh, but it's one I can't sing very well, and probably you can't sing very well. Um, so I have some help. Um, and the help is a friend of mine who's a musician who recorded this. Um, and I want to play it for you. It's called Catalyze. You can sing if you want. 
Okay, that's good enough. All right, good enough. All right, excellent. Okay, I heard saw some of you singing along. That's good. So, extra credit. Looks like we're getting it there. Okay, so that's uh, the material. Where the material will stop for the uh, first exam. So you can mark your notes accordingly. And since we've got about ten minutes, it gives us a little bit of a running start for the material for the second exam. So I'm going to go and get and dig into that. And these lectures are called catalytic strategies. Okay. All right. Well, we've been talking about how enzymes work, and we've been talking about it in very general ways. We've been primarily interested in enzymes um, with respect to the speed with which they, they actually work. All right. Well, now we want to turn our attention to some of the mechanisms that they use to work. We saw a little bit of mechanism when we saw a hemoglobin, and we're going to see similar things when we see mechanisms by which enzymes work, but we're going to see they're going to be more complicated because there are chemical reactions that are actually occurring. Okay? So that's important for us to keep in mind. Most of what we'll <clears throat> be talking about in these lectures are proteases. Not all, but most of what we'll be talking about are proteases. Proteases, I'll, I will remind you, are enzymes that cleave proteins. They break peptide bonds. So proteases cleave peptide bonds. Okay? This schematically shows the, the reaction that's catalyzed by a protease. Here's a peptide, here's a peptide bond, so we have a long R group over here, we have a long R group over here, and here in the middle is a peptide bond. And this might be trypsin that we talked about, this might be chymotrypsin, it might be a, any of a variety of uh, proteases. And what they're catalyzing is the addition of water back across that peptide bond. And when they add water to that, what you make is a free carboxyl and a free alpha amine. Okay? So that's the type of reaction that they're catalyzing. Okay. Here, when we look at chymotrypsin, we see uh, marked a couple of the places where the enzyme chymotrypsin will uh, cut. Okay? Chymotrypsin will cut on the carboxyl side of phenylalanine, also on the carboxyl side of methionine. Somebody asked me earlier today, what does it mean when you say on the carboxyl side or the amine side of something? Well, if we orient things so that we have the free amine on the left and the free carboxyl on the right, the carboxyl side, any amino acid has an amine side, an alpha carbon, and an alpha carboxyl. So the amine side would be over here, the carboxyl side would be over here. That would mean that chymotrypsin would cut on the right side over here. Similarly, over here. Here's the alpha amine, the alpha carbon, and the alpha carboxyl. Okay? This is where these, uh, the, this enzyme would cut the, this peptide in both of these places. All right? So we want to understand a little bit about how it works. Well, it turns out that chymotrypsin is an enzyme that has a serine in its active site. And we can tell that very readily by treating chymotrypsin with, with uh, DIPF, and we discover that the activity goes completely away. So this tells us something very important. The very important message that it tells us is that serine plays a very important role in the catalytic process that you just saw. That is the addition of water across the peptide bond. So, Serine is one of the very big players in that process. Okay. Well, um, before I tell you too much more about the enzyme, I, want, I need to tell you a little bit about the fact that biochemists are lazy. Okay? You'll hear me say this, you may have heard me say this before, and you'll hear me say it many times, but biochemists basically are lazy. We like to study things in the simplest way possible. I'm sure you guys, when you're studying for an exam, like to think of the same sort of thing, so maybe you're as lazy as a biochemist is. You never know, right? Well, one of the ways in which we're lazy is that if we want to study, let's say, peptide bond cleavage, it's fairly hard to do that. We have to run gels, we have to do all kinds of analysis to tell us did a particular peptide bond get 
cleaved. And biochemists don't have a lot of time either. So one of the things that we do is we uh, frequently find reagents that enzymes can work on that tell us very simply the answer to the question that we're asking, which is, is this enzyme working? Okay. Well, one of the reagents that we use is on the screen. You don't need to know the name or any of that. Okay. I just show it to you to reveal what this, this reagent does. So here is a molecule that I can mix with chymotrypsin. And chymotrypsin will recognize this as if it is a peptide that it's going to cut. It will, in fact, break it into two pieces. And when it breaks it into two pieces, one of the pieces turns color. This makes it really easy for me to determine, is my chymotrypsin working? Okay, Is it working or is it not working? Well, if I see yellow color being produced, I say it's working. That's nice and simple. I can put it into a machine, and the machine can tell me very quickly, not only is yellow color being produced, but how much yellow color is being produced. So I not only get a measure of, is the enzyme working, but how well is the enzyme working? OK? So we use reagents like this sometimes to help us study things. Now, as I said, you don't need to know the structure, the name, or any of that. But just recognize that there are some reagents that change color that help us. All right. Well, when people started studying chymotrypsin, and they had this reagent, they discovered something very odd. Very odd. And I'm going to come back and talk about this. Not, I, I will talk about this next time, not um, um, today. But I will, I will uh, come back and talk about it uh, on Friday. That something very odd that they saw. When they mixed this reagent with chymotrypsin, that they saw that there was a very quick, OK? We're looking here at the basically velocity. This is absorbance. That's the amount of yellow color released. So this is velocity on the y-axis versus time. Now, that's different than we saw before. Velocity versus time on the x-axis. What they saw was that there was a burst of activity that went up linearly with time. And then it kind of petered out and flattened out into this other uh, uh, line that's here. That's not nearly as steep. The steepness tells us the velocity with which this is occurring. Well, why did we see this burst and then a leveling out? or not a leveling off, but at least a lowering of the, the rate. Why do we see this? Well, when people saw this, they recognized that chymotrypsin had to be working in two steps. The reaction it's catalyzing is occurring in two distinct steps. One step that occurs very rapidly, and one step that occurs much more slowly. Okay, So it's a two-step process. That two-step process turns out to be rather interesting, OK? Because what happens in the action of chymotrypsin is the first step of the process involves the breaking of the peptide bond. And you thought, well, that was the whole thing, right? Well, no. Because the breaking of the peptide bond causes part of the protein that gets broken to covalently bind to the active site. I'll repeat that. Okay. The breaking of the peptide bond causes part of the protein being broken to bind to the active site. And the first thing that's going to pop into your head after what I've been talking about is suicide inhibitor, right? Because that's what happens when you have covalent bonds that happen at the active site. Guess what? This is not a suicide inhibitor. Because if it were, the enzyme would only work on one protein, and that would be the end of it. Instead, this covalent bond that's made with the active site of this chymotrypsin is transient. The fast step happens, the, making, the breaking of the, of the peptide bond and the joining of the polypeptide to the active site. The slow step is the removal of that covalent bond. So the fast step is the breaking of the first one and the attachment. And I'll, I'll give you more of a mechanism of this next time. The slow step is the removal of that um, uh, second peptide from the active site. 
a fast step and a slow step that occurs. Okay. Now, um, chymotrypsin turns out to have not just serine in its active site that's important, but it has what we call the catalytic triad. The catalytic triad. The catalytic triad consists of three amino acids that are located near each other in the active site of the enzyme. The three amino acids are aspartic acid, histidine, and serine. They're oriented inside of the active site, something like what you see on the screen. Now, you wonder what those numbers are? Well, that's their number in the primary sequence. This is amino acid number 102. This is amino acid number 57. And this is amino acid number 195. And my first question to you is, how in the world can they be that close to each other if they're that far apart? The answer is folding, right? Tertiary structure arises from folding. And folding has brought these guys into close proximity. I told you folding was essential for enzyme activity. Well, now you see it. If this folding doesn't happen properly, these guys don't get close to each other, and this enzyme doesn't work. Right? OK. Now I've got two minutes left. I'm going to tell you just very quickly how this enzyme works, and I'm going to show you in detail on Friday. All right? The enzyme breaks peptide bonds. And the serine is involved in breaking those peptide bonds. In order for the serine to break a peptide bond, it's got to have its hydrogen taken off of it. It's physically taken off of it. Okay. So what the enzyme is doing when it is catalyzing a reaction is it has to have this, hyd this hydrogen off of the hydroxide. All right. So the enzyme binds to its proper substrate. And when the enzyme binds to its proper substrate, what do you suppose happens inside of the enzyme? You suppose there's a slight shape change? There is. The aspartic acid gets closer to the histidine. Well, the aspartic acid is negatively charged, and the histidine is full of electrons in this ring. What do you suppose the electrons in that ring do when the negative charge gets close to them? They slide to the right. And when they slide to the right, this guy now here is more negatively charged than it was before. And what do negative charges attract? Positive charges. And what is a proton? A positive charge. So in simple terms, what's happened is the binding of the proper substrate has caused these geometries to change so that the proton gets removed. We'll see next time how the removal of that proton <coughs> catalyzes the reaction. OK, see you guys on Friday.